Hey church, it's getting rough out here when the pastor has to live stream from his garage. Well, actually it's not that bad. I thought you would enjoy a change of scenery and you'll understand why I'm recording at this location in just a moment. Uh, this actually reminds me of a show I loved back in the 90s called Home Improvement. You remember that one? How many of you liked that show? I know my wife did because she had a crush on Jonathan Ta Thomas. The main character was Tim Taylor. He was a host of a home improvement show. Do you remember by chance the name of his show? Anybody out there? Who'll be the first to type the right answer in the comments right now? Uh, if you type the right answer, I'll send you a gift card to Home Depot this week. What's the name of the show? Anybody got it? I think I see it there. Tool Time, that's right. And here was the funny thing about Tool Time. The irony of the plot of Tim the Tool Man was that he was not as handy at home as he was on the screen. And I can relate. Don't let these tools behind me fool you. I like tools because they make me feel useful and needed around the house, though I really don't know how to use half of them. And for some of us, that's a realistic comparison to the Bible. You lay around, you let it lay around the house, but you never really grasp the meaning or take the time to study it for yourself. And that's why we as a church are committed to preaching the Bible and not just talking about current events and culture and politics. We believe the word of God is the most powerful tool on this planet. And if you will allow it to, it will change your life. And for the past 12 weeks, we have been on a life-changing journey to spiritual freedom as we walk through the second book of the Bible, Exodus. And can we take a moment and celebrate with those who have made spiritual decisions and even placed their faith in Jesus during this series? Come on, right now, let's have an online praise party. That's what we're all about. Come on, take it just a second, take a praise break, and let's give God the glory there. Drop some praise hands in the comments, and we just thank God for all those who've come to know Jesus. And today, I'm going to end this series and next week, believe it or not, we're going to celebrate Easter like we have never celebrated it before. As a matter of fact, if you are in the Cincinnati area watching this and actively attend our church, be sure you email us your address or fill out an online connection card so we can make sure we have your information because we're preparing an Easter care basket for all of our members that are going to be delivered this Thursday or this Friday. And if you would like to help us make those deliveries, be sure to let us know. But before we're ready for Easter, we have to finish our series today. How many of you watched the Ten Commandments on TV last night? Pretty good timing, right? I wonder if you're ready for our last sermon in our Exodus series. If you are, come on, drop a thumbs up emoji right now. I'm waiting to see the first thumbs up emoji. You ready? Okay, good. Okay, Exodus 35. Exodus 35. There are 40 chapters in the books of book of Exodus, but we're ending our series in Exodus 35, and we're going to beginning, we're going to begin our reading in verse number four. Are you ready? Here we go. It says, Moses has left Sinai. Now, I'm not reading yet. I'm just giving you the title of the chapter here that the, that the writers, uh, of the, the compilers of this particular Bible writes. Moses has left Mount Sinai. He spent 40 days quarantined alone with God on that mountain. And when he left the mountain in Exodus 34, 29 tells us that he wasn't the same. He didn't even look the same because of the glory of God that was radiating off of him. Wouldn't that be amazing if when our time of isolation is over, we came out of it different? And, and I mean in a good way, because we saw the face of God. You know, the alternative is what the people did while Moses was on the mountain in isolation. They went looking for new gods. So what's the first thing? We're getting ready to read it. What's the first thing Moses did after his 40 days of social isolation? It's found in verse number four and verse number five. Let me read it for you. It says, And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, 
This is the thing which the Lord commanded saying, take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. He took an offering. Now, I promise you, this isn't a setup. In no way am I being tone deaf to the current realities that we're all facing by proposing this is a good time to take an offering. But I unapologetically believe the best time for the followers of Jesus to unleash generosity is during a crisis. So Moses is receiving an offering as a solution to their and our greatest need. And that need is the presence of God. So God says, I want you, Moses, to make a mobile place of worship. Very much what we do, very much like what we do at our campuses located at the schools. Or it's like what I have set up here in my garage. God says, I want a portable church, a portable place of worship, one that is movable, one that is adaptable, one that settles down when my presence is known, and one that will get up and go when I am on the moon, says the Lord, in, in the Kirk Kirkland version. So they take an offering for this big tent, or a tabernacle, as Moses calls it. And the tent is being used as a vehicle for worship. The tent was a tool to bring about God's purposes on the earth. God could manifest himself in any way he willed, but he chose to use a tool to accomplish his purposes. He didn't need anything, but he chooses to use tools in the way that he interacts with us. Now you understand why we're here in the garage, don't you? Have you ever had a situation or a job that you didn't have the right tool? What did you do? Well, either you improvised, which usually doesn't work out so well, does it? Or, I mean, you learn how to blacksmith and make your own tools, or... Like the majority of people, what do you do? You go out and buy one. Well, recently we were having a fence installed in our backyard and I had a problem. I had this leaning tree. I think I have a picture uh, of it for you. I had this leaning tree that uh, I felt like could fall at any time. You see that tree there? Look at that. It's, it's dangerous. So I, I decided to cut it down. I decided to cut it down the day before our fence was installed. I mean, I guess I, I figured I would eliminate the risk of it falling on the fence. Or, I mean, worse, uh, I didn't want it to fall on our kids. But I waited to the last minute so that I had to solve the problem myself, right? Because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to cut down a tree. And so after watching about 20 people on YouTube almost kill themselves cutting down trees, uh, I was an expert. The only problem was... I didn't have a chainsaw. Well, uh, Karen was out shopping, so I asked her to pick, uh, pick me up a, a chainsaw. Now, hoping that she would get a good one and maybe save a little money, I told her not to get the cheapest one, but not to get the most expensive one. Are you like that? You, you don't want the cheapest one, but you don't want the most expensive one. And, and I knew she wasn't too thrilled about me having a chainsaw either. So she comes home with a 16 inch Craftsman chainsaw. Well, I made one cut into that tree and I realized I didn't have the best tool for the size tree that I was cutting down. So what did I need? What was it that I needed? What? <laughs> More power, right? More power. And I needed a bigger bar. So I went and got a 20 inch, uh, matter of fact, I got this chainsaw right here that's hanging on my wall. I got a 20 inch chainsaw. Uh, one of the more top of the line uh, pieces of equipment. And long story short, I, I have a stack of logs in my backyard waiting to be split. Who wants to come and help me? But I want you to know this. I've also learned that uh, cutting down the tree and getting them in the logs, and that's not the end of the job. After you get the logs, you, you got to split them. And that's not the easiest job. What I've learned is 
you, you've got to have the right tools here. Now, I, I happen to have um, a, a, this log here. And maybe you would think, well, I know the right tool is, is not this little hatchet. I know that's not going to do anything. So I went out and I, and I, and I got myself an axe, right? Pretty sharp. I actually got a sharpener too. And I know it's just, it's really um, confounded and complicated here. Uh, but what I've learned is this axe isn't good uh, for spit, uh, splitting logs like I have here. Now, what it's really good for is uh, moving some of these logs around. And so it really kind of saved my back. Uh, the fact that I could just use this here and, and slide it around like I did so. But as you can see there, it really isn't made for splitting these big logs. So uh, what did I do? I went and I got another tool, right? I got, yeah, the mother of all axes here. I, I, I got a, a splitter. And so uh, maybe if I could just demonstrate this, if you can see this on my other camera here. Um, uh, I'm going to try my best without killing anybody because I don't want to go viral in that way. Okay, so uh, come up here and they come down. But what do you see there? Even this high dollar, highfalutin, big, uh, big Bertha axe tool. Oh, excuse me there. It, it, oh, man, it really isn't even made uh, for splitting these types of logs. And so what I learned is I need a different type of tool. Oh man, I, I don't know if this is going to ruin my illustration here. Oh, oh. I cut out for this. So what do I need? I, I don't know that I'm going to split uh, this log here on this camera, but what I need is a different tool. I need something that I didn't even know that was used for splitting uh, logs. And so maybe if I get this started here. And uh, let me see, do a little work here. You ready? Ready, church? Okay. I think I'm gonna stop while I'm ahead. Okay. I think I think you get the point. What's the point? <laughs> Wow. Um, I think the point is you need the right tool for the job. And I don't even know uh, after all the trips to Home Depot and Lowe's that I have the right tool for the job. And what I see in the remainder of this chapter is God's purposes being accomplished on earth because he had the right tools. Am I talking about the tabernacle? No, not yet. I mean, how do they get a tabernacle? Do they order it on Amazon? Of course not. Here's the secret to life. Some of us are waiting around for the right thing to just pop in our life. But that's not how God always works. He doesn't give you the thing Sometimes he gives you the tools to get to the thing. Can I give you an example? Are you lonely? Well, community isn't found, it's built. The Bible says, he who wants friends must show himself friendly. Do you need a team? Maybe you lead an organization or you have a business or you're in a certain department and you need a team to accomplish your mission. So where do you go out and recruit, uh, find a team of all-stars? Well, great teams aren't found. They just don't pop into your office. They're built. What you need is the right tools to build the right things. And in Exodus chapter 35, I see three tools that God used to build his tabernacle, and they are three tools that God uses to build his kingdom today and to accomplish the purpose for which we were made, for the reason we were put on this earth. What is that? What is that purpose? It's to love God and to love others and to make disciples. Those tools are to accomplish the great commandment and the great commission. And so I, 
I failed today with these tools. I, I didn't have the right tools, or at least I didn't have uh, the right muscle. But God gives us tools in Exodus chapter 35. Three of them that accomplish his purpose in building the tabernacle and also accomplish his purpose in building the kingdom. Are you ready for them? You ready? Here we go. Number one is a willing heart. Number two, a gifted artist. And number three, a stirred spirit. A willing heart. Look at the first one. Look in verse number four and five. We'll put it up on the screen. It says, and Moses spoke to all the congregation, of the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, take from among you an offering to the Lord. Notice this. Whoever is of a willing heart. This is for everyone. There's no skills needed. The greatest ability is availability. In this chapter, everyone, rich, Poor men, women, anyone whose heart was willing was used by God. And the people were willing. Everyone played their part. And that's the type of people God is using to accomplish his purposes today. People with a willing heart. One of my favorite stories is about Booker T. Washington, one of the founders of Tuskegee University. Soon after he became the president of the college, and this is in the middle of Jim Crow and the segregated South, he was walking in a well-to-do part of town. Well, he walks by a certain lady's home, and the lady didn't recognize, didn't know who this famous Booker T. Washington was, so she invited him to cut some wood for him. Well, Booker T. Washington, being a humble man, he rolled up his sleeves, he smiled, and he he cut the wood, obviously he did a lot better job than I did, cut it up in neat stacks and actually laid it neatly in her home. And, and she offered to pay him money. Well, later on, a little girl said, don't you know who that was? That's Booker T. Washington. He's the president of the college. Well, just kind of mortified, the woman went and sought out uh, Mr. Washington. And not only did she become friends with him, but she she got some of her friends to begin to donate towards the university. And, and together with her her donations and her friends' donations, they gave uh, tens of thousands of dollars to that university. Mr. Washington was willing. It didn't matter what his position was, what his title was. And I want you to know that his willingness made a difference. It made an impact that went past himself. So number one was a, was a willing heart. Number two, a gifted artist. Look at verse 10. Look what it says there, if we can put it up on the screen. It says, all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Here the Lord is calling for his special forces. Maybe when you think of that, you would think of that being like the equivalent of Whitney Houston um, or Michael Jackson on the praise team. Or maybe you would think of Steven Spielberg or, or the team at Pixar on the church production team. Or, or maybe it would be like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs on the church board of trustees. Or, go with me here, maybe it's just normal everyday people who God has gifted. And I believe that everyone has a gift. If you can smile, you are gifted. If you can write, you are gifted. If you can think, you have a gift. If you can cook, you have a gift. Come on, somebody say amen. Look at verse number 34. Maybe this will help us. It says, all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded, and he has put in his heart the ability to teach. Ah, see that? Teaching is a gift. When you look at it that way, there are so many people that I'm speaking to right now that have become so used to your gift that you're blind to it. And if you do something for a living and you actually make a living doing it, you probably have a gift driving it. So what's your gift? I want you to know that God wants to use your gift as a tool to change the world. And then lastly, number three, 
What kind of tools does God use? He used a willing heart. He used a gifted artist. And lastly, he used a stirred spirit. Look at verse number 21. All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all of its service and for the holy garments. Did you hear that? Somebody got stirred up and God used that. Some of you are stir crazy, but I wonder if anyone is stirred up on the other side of this camera. There are problems in this world that God will use us, his tools to fix in this world. Do you know that there are enough churches in America that if just one or two families in every church in America got stirred up for caring for the orphans, that we could end child care, we could end uh, the foster care system in our country, we could, the church could fix it if somebody would get stirred up. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he told this young pastor who he was mentoring, he says in 2 Timothy 1, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now when you hear about getting stirred up, maybe you're like, but what about, what about what we're going through and what about my needs and what about this? Paul didn't want to hear about the what abouts. As a matter of fact, what's the next verse after Paul tells Timothy to get stirred up? He then says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I remember a mission conference that I had the privilege to be a part of and to be the keynote speaker. After the end of that conference, there was a woman who came to me and she said, Pastor, I'm really stirred up for missions. And this is what I want to do for missionaries. She said, I have a car, it has about 100,000 miles on it or so. She said, before this mission conference, I had determined I was going to go to the dealership. I was going to go trade that car in and get a brand new car. She said, but you know what? I believe God will allow my car to keep running. And I'm going to, I'm going to use that used car for another year. And I'm going to take what would be the car payment. And I'm going to give that to missions and missionaries so that more people around the world can hear the story about Jesus. That woman got stirred up about lost people coming home, coming to know their Lord and their Savior. And so what I want for our church is to be used of God, to be tools in his hand. And I want us to get stirred up. Come on, can we just take this week and let's get stirred up about inviting people to the online Easter service next week so that they hear about Jesus. I mean, there's never an easier time for someone to join us. They can sit at their home in their pajamas and come to an Easter service at our church we take personal responsibility for every lost son and daughter in our city. You may say, that's a big responsibility. How are we going to do that, Pastor? Well, have you ever heard someone say, how do you eat an elephant? What's the answer? One bite at a time. I love that little thought. How do you eat an elephant? How do you accomplish a big goal? Just one step, one thing one person, one invitation at a time. You know, but as I think about that little illustration, you know what's an even better way to eat an elephant? Not just one bite at a time, but to eat it one bite at a time with a team of people around you. Tools, people wanting to be used. But you know, I, I thought about that even further. And what about this? Not just one bite at a time and not just a team of people eating one bite at a time. But what if that team of people were hungry? What if they were really starving and hungry? I mean, that would be a good way to eat an elephant. Can I ask you a question? I know that's a silly illustration, but can I say, ask you something very serious? Are you hungry for God to move? Are you stirred up? You know what I think? Maybe if we got stirred up, God would stir some things up. What do you think about that? Well, here's the end of that, this whole story in Exodus chapter 35, going on to the end of the book. What's the end result? Well, Exodus 36, 5 and 7 
says something that that happened that doesn't happen very often. As a matter of fact, only two times in the Bible do I ever see this thing happening. And uh, in current days, it doesn't happen very often. You know what happens? The people start bringing in their offering. They start bringing their gold and their silver and their bronze and, and women are spinning and men are working and crafting and everyone brings their offering to the Lord. Yes, the skilled people, but then just normal everyday people. And you know what happened? There was so much that the people told Moses, Moses, we, we have too much. We have enough. And so Moses actually makes a decree and says, stop giving. There is more than enough here. They told the people to stop giving that what they had brought was sufficient for the work. And I believe in all of my heart, if God's people, the willing hearted people, the gifted, talented, skilled, able-bodied people, those people who will be stirred up for the service of God, if we would come together to be tools in God's hands, I think there is so much. I think there is more than enough, more than enough resources, more than enough laborers, more than enough volunteers, more than enough effort, more than enough passion to change this world. What they brought was sufficient for the work. And I think that's the spirit of the Christian life. I mean, in light of all that God has done for us, his amazing grace, his forgiveness, his limitless love, it causes us to give in excess, to give out of the overflow of our heart. Remember the story of the short man Zacchaeus who found forgiveness? What did he tell Jesus after he found forgiveness? He told Jesus he was giving back half of what he owned. Remember the little lady in Bethany named Mary who brought her alabaster box to Jesus and she broke that box and she poured it out on his feet because she knew Jesus was giving his life to be a sacrifice and she poured out that oil on Jesus' feet. How much was that little box worth? Do you remember? A whole year's wages. And there's others who said, what a waste. This was an extravagant gift that she just poured out on Jesus because her heart was touched. And then Paul, he's writing to this church at Philippi and he commends them. He commended that church for giving out of their poverty. I mean, they didn't have much for themselves, but what they had, they gave because they had already received God's love. And God used all of those people that I just mentioned. How did he use them? He used them as tools. He used them as vehicles so that people around them could hear the good news that Jesus loves them and he gave his life so that they could have a new one in him. And today, God is using the internet as a tool so that you can hear about God's love. So right now, I want to invite you, if this message is touching your heartstrings and God is moving in your spirit, would you just call out to Jesus? Would you just repent of your sins and believe in him? Come on, just call out on him and say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died and that you rose again. Jesus, I give you my life. Help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you pray from your heart to receive Jesus, would you let us know that in just a moment? Someone's going to help you get connected to our church in a further way, and we would love to celebrate with you. We don't want anything from you. We want everything for you. And church, now is the time to be generous. This is the time that we unleash generosity in our land. And one way is to give through our local church. Notice what I said. I said give through, not to. Just this past week, we've been collecting offerings. It actually got to a point uh, that I said to someone who said, hey, how's the meal thing going? I said, hey, we have enough for what we're doing right now. I mean, almost literally what happened in the book of Exodus. But 
but there's still more need. So uh, it's not enough right now, but it was then. But anyway, we went out and we, we served meals in our community. We partnered with our, our local elementary school. And one of our missionaries that we support, Jim and Karen Green, Jim said, I want to go out and pass meals with you, pass out meals with you. And so Jim loaded up his meals and we, we got our gloves on. We love our vehicles. And Jim goes down the street. He tells me later on, he, he meets this lady and she says, how in the world did you get my information? She was so taken back. She says, you didn't know, but I lost my way to pay for groceries. I just literally lost it within a day. And here you show up on my door with food. You see, God used you when you donate to through our church. You, God used you to feed that lady and her child. So I want to commend you for continuing to give, in, even in the middle of crisis, because it is now when God's people must unleash generosity. And so I just want to pray just in a moment for the offering. You can take a phone and you can text the word Cincy, C-I-N-C-Y, to the number 7797. And you can have a part in what God is doing to change our city and change our world. Can I pray for you and pray for the offering? And, uh, and then I just want you to stick around for a moment. I want you to hear how you can connect to our church. Come on, can I pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this tool that we are using right now. Your mission has not stopped and it won't be stopped. The gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And so Lord, I wanna pray for every single person who's participating this morning in worship through giving and are giving through our church so that you may touch the world and more people may come to know you. Bless, I pray the gift and the giver in Jesus' name.